Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into The Profitable Musician Show. Hello, my name is Bree Noble, and thank you for tuning in to the podcast. I am excited to be here today with Emily Stevenson from Downtown Music. They also uh, own Song Trust, if you're familiar with that brand. I would love to start the show, Emily, by just getting your background in the industry, how you ended up in Nashville working for Downtown Music Publishing, and all the things. Of course. Thanks for having me. This is really exciting. Yeah, so I actually am a rare breed in that I grew up in Nashville. So I am born and raised, and I um, started my career in publishing here in Nashville, and then actually moved to New York um, to work for Song Trust, and was in New York for um, about seven years, and have done a variety of things under the downtown umbrella um, on the publishing side from publishing administration, including royalties and copyright, to um, international expansion and client services, um, business operations, and have started in this new role as the president of the publishing company in January of this year. And somewhere in there, I moved back to Nashville (laughs) to raise a family um, and be home. And it's so fantastic to be back, but um, I do travel to New York often. That's cool. I love that. I love that you're based in Nashville. Most people aren't. So yeah. many people like migrated from California during the pandemic to Nashville that it must feel like a foreign place now. Yeah, it's it's different, but you know what? I I welcome it. I think it's fantastic. I love um what our growth has been able to do to the city and you know we have fantastic restaurants and fantastic activities and it's a really lovely place to live um and we've been able to maintain you know our personality and our culture and you know I love Nashville I think it's fantastic I welcome newcomers (laughs) that's cool yeah I gotta get back I I think the last time I was there was 2007 so I'm sure it's so different (laughs) very different than 2007 yes awesome well let's start with I want to just lay the groundwork for publishing because I still find that artists, independent artists, especially if you're new, um, don't even understand exactly what publishing is, what the role of a publisher is, and then what like uh, a publishing like administrator is. Yeah. Um, So, you know, it's, it's easiest to look at this from a copyright perspective. So any song that you listen to, Um, contains two copyrights. One copyright is the actual sound recording. So um, what the musicians and producer and um, sound engineer created in the studio. That's that's one copyright that is intellectual property owned by the people that contributed to it. The other copyright side of a song is the actual composition. So the way that the music was composed, the lyrics that were written, and that is the composition side. Publishing represents that composition piece of all songs. So for a any number of songs, you can have thousands of sound recordings for that one song. But as a publisher, we represent the song. It doesn't matter who's singing it or recording it. Um, and so what a publisher does is looks after that. And there are traditional publishing deals where, you know, a publisher might want a portion of your ownership because they're doing things to contribute to They got you maybe in that writing session or they're pitching it for an artist to record it. So there's some, um, you know, active work that publishing companies do to substantiate the ownership that they take. Um, We do things a little bit differently at Downtown and Song Trust, which is we don't take ownership of songs. We just um, ask for a fee to manage that catalog for you. So we register the copyrights. We collect your royalties. We do any licensing. Um, We do um, creative work 
for a, a good portion of the catalog for sync and things like that. But um, yeah, that's what a publishing administrator does is allows you to own the copyright outright. Like we want you to own the work that you create, but we'll look after it for you because that side of the business is really quite complicated and um, can be especially complicated for somebody who's kind of just starting out in their career. Got it. Okay. So is every publisher a publishing administrator or are some publishers just not real? I mean, their job really is to go out there and, and promote the song and get people to, to record it and sync it and all of that stuff, right? Yeah, it depends. Um, different publishing companies are set up in different ways. Some publishing companies only want to do the creative work. They don't want to worry about any of the back office any of the licensing, anything like that. So what they'll do is, and this is makes up a large portion of the clients on the downtown music publishing side is they will come to us and say, Hey, we've got the like A&R and creative covered. We want to sign our own writers, but will you handle everything else for us? We don't want to issue royalty statements. We don't want to do income tracking. We don't want to pay for licenses. We don't want to negotiate sync rates. Can you handle all of that for us and let us just focus on the creative? So in that case, that publisher would not be a publishing administrator um, because they're not actually doing any of the admin work. And then there are some companies that do both, you know, actually historically downtown used to do, and we, we, let me be clear too. We have a &R, fantastic a &R team. We have a fantastic sync creative team. Um, but we also have this very robust admin side, which is what makes us a little bit unique. So, um, you know, there are companies that do both where some writers we sign and, um, or historically we would have signed and taken a piece of the ownership because we're doing all the things that I mentioned before. Um, and then some folks we just sign for admin deals because they don't want to tap in as much to the creative services. So um, it kind of varies. But now that we are strictly admin and we don't ever take ownership, um, obviously all of our clients get to benefit from the creative offerings that we have. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Well, hmm. I should be clear <laughs> on the downtown music publishing side. Yes. Um, on the song trust side, the creative services are a little bit different. Um, we do, we will like paper sync licenses for people and do those negotiations. If that's something they, they would like us to do, we don't have to do that. You can do that on your own if you want to, but we, you know, the, the nice thing is, is like when we get feedback from song trust clients that are like, I would like to tap in more to the creative services. My career is really picking up. I have all this happening. Could could you got could I lean into the downtown um, creative side? Then you know there's a really easy transition and funnel to like push them over to the downtown music publishing side if that's a better fit for where they are in their career. That's really cool. I love that they have that option. Now, can you? kind of explain like the difference between song trust and downtown like is song trust really more for indie artists or is it just like the level of help that they need of course um so really it's you know it's the two companies have created specific personalities for their clients but that's not really how we think about it internally what we think about is really the service offering um, so with song trust, it's meant to be a very like self-service, easy, simple royalty collection offering where, um, you know, anybody can sign up to get their royalties cl correct, collected, their songs registered, and all they really need to ever do is log into a portal, submit that information, you know, what, a, like ter exchange data <laughs> between us and themselves. And that's it. On the downtime and, and the song trust side is also like everybody gets the same rate. Everybody has the same sign up fee. It's very uniformed on the song trust side. And on the downtown side, it's much more bespoke. Um, and because there's a, a variety of different things that we do on the downtime music publishing side that we don't do on the song trust side, those deals are all negotiated individually. They all look a little bit different based on what clients are looking for. Um, the way that they interact with the company is different. They don't turn in songs on a portal. They're talking to our client services team directly and, you know, things like that. So they're a little bit different. And we, again, that's what we think about. We think about the service offering. Um, however, it has definitely created personalities among our clients, whereas we do have a lot of independent creators on the song trust side. 
um, at all stages of their career, which is really cool to get to see that, you know, what works for somebody who's getting millions of streams on Spotify works for the same person who has just started creating music and is maybe distributing through CD Baby um, and wants to collect on the publishing side. So that's really fantastic. And then on the downtown side, we have individual creators, we have artists, we also have companies. It's, it's more B2B um, and larger publishers sign up with us. We can do specific territories if they want to. So it's a little bit different, but um, yeah, it's, it's a really nice range of people. And it allows us to think, you know, by having both Songtrust and Downtown Music under one management, it allows us to think when we are making decisions about the direction of the company or when we're renegotiating a license with Spotify or someone, we think about it from all of our clients' perspective. And it's not just focused on either the independent songwriters or, you know, the professionalized B2B, like, you know, larger publishing companies. It's really, um, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a diverse group of people. Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I can see how those both working together, those different perspectives can benefit both sides for sure. Like you said, when you're negotiating, is this publishing admin like non-exclusive? So if somebody signs up with Song Trust or Downtown and then they get approached directly for a licensing deal, they can do that, right? Well, it's all, it all depends <laughs> on what you're talking about. Um, on Song Trust, you do maintain non-exclusive sync rights. So sync, just to back up, because I realize I'm just kind of throwing that jargon out there. Sync is um, the synchronization of music to a visual a visual work. So think about it as like songs you hear in TV and commercials and um, music trailers and video games, that's sync. So on the song trust side, you know, we're happy to paper a license for you and negotiate that license for you if that's something that you want us to do. Now we're not actively pitching all of the song trust catalog because it is non-exclusive. And it was but if it comes massive, in like a massive catalog. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like in good faith, we can't just say like we're pitching the entire catalog. There's it's a it's a huge catalog. Um and so we um but yeah, we we do there are certain clients that we um you know have created this relationship where it makes sense to do that, but um, we, we can negotiate. So that's non-exclusive. Um, the song trust deal is also interesting because, um, you know, also in publishing, generally you either do like a general agreement or a specific agreement. And general means we have the right to administer your entire catalog. Everything that's under your remit, we will administer specific is you tell us what songs you want us to administer and we'll administer those songs. Song trusts are all specific agreements. So you can bring your whole catalog to us if you'd like to, but if there's only five songs you want us to administer and you want to keep the other 50 for yourself, or you're just not sure what you want to do with them yet, that's fine as well. Um, but the right to register copyrights and collect royalties on those songs that you do give us is an exclusive right. Um, because if you then gave a different publisher the same right, it would just throw everything into conflict. Income sources wouldn't know who to pay. So um, you, that has to be exclusive. And that's true of any publisher. And then on the downtown side, it's kind of similar. It all depends. Um, but for the most part, those rights are exclusive as well because of all the things that I mentioned before about creating confusion with income sources and them not knowing which publisher administrator to pay or which songs. Got it. That totally makes sense. And you know, I, what you said about the way the song trust works, it makes sense that it, it's called song trust, not artist trust, right? So it's, <laughs> you're signing up individual songs and, you know, asking you to administrate them. So that totally yeah. makes sense to me. So let's like kind of do a, a, let's pull back from your company in like a bigger view, uh, being a publisher in the industry and working with one for so long yourself, you know, what do you think makes a really good publisher and what should, should artists be looking for, whether they go with you guys or someone else? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's a, and it kind of depends to be honest on where you're, where you are in your career and what you're looking for. Um, but you know, what I think 
makes a great publisher is looking at the way or understanding the way that the publishing company is thinking about collection. Um, because, you know, at the end of the day, you can get all the creative services, right? You can get your song in front of all the biggest a &Rs, But if you don't have the infrastructure in place to actually collect on those royalties in the most efficient way possible with the fewest hands in the pot, then um, what's it all worth, you know? So I think that for us, something that we pride ourselves on a lot is that we, in the US, you have um, a handful of societies is what we call them, um, where you can represent them. They, they represent you. And this is getting even more confusing, but there's a, there's a portion of publishing royalties called writer performance. And it's about 25% of the overall copyright. And writers are entitled to collect that directly. Um, publishers cannot collect on that. So that is just your stream that you have to use either ASCAP or BMI or someone like that to collect. Um, so that is something that, um, you know, all of our writers maintain their right to collect their writer performance share. Um, but there's different societies all over the world. Um, in the US, it's mo for the, the big ones are ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. But what Song Trust has done, as well as Downtown Music Publishing, is we have created direct lines to all of those um, societies internationally. So we're not like going to a publisher in the UK and saying, hey, can you help us figure out how to get our royalties out of the UK? We are just going there directly. We've set up shop in the UK. We work with the society there. And so our strategy is go as direct as possible to as many places as possible. Um, so you get to collect that money directly. Um, so I think that's a really interesting thing to look at um, in a publisher. I think what you what should be considered too is what are publishers doing with their data right now? Mm. Um, are you maximizing data? Are you analyzing royalty statements? Are you doing what you can to collect metadata from your clients and from various sources like the streaming services? Um, or are you just kind of like, you know, taking what your writers give you and passing them on? So we're doing a lot of data enrichment on our side, which is leading to a lot of additional revenue for our clients. So there's a variety of ways to think about it, but those are the things that we're prioritizing right now. And those are the things that I'm finding for us are, you know, helping us win deals. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that's really important, the data, because a lot of times artists don't even know, you know, their song is playing on some something in Europe or, you know, like other countries. How would we know that that's even happening if we're not collecting the data? Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I think that's really important. And then, you know, there's this kind of term for artists, which people throw around, you know, fair pay. Mm -hmm. Is is fair pay like making sure you're getting all the payments you're owed or making sure that you're getting enough from each place and they're not like screwing you? Yeah. So there's two sides to that, right? And there's one that's a lot easier to influence than the other. <laughs> yeah. Um, the one side of it is, you know, setting royalty rates with income sources. So that, especially here in the U.S., is a lot of work that's done in D.C., actually, um, and negotiating, um, like, old rates that have been, um, you know, set for decades. Um, and that is something that, like, the NMPA does a fantastic job of. Um, the NMPA is the National Music Publishers Association, and they are in Washington. They're based in Washington on the Hill. They are, you know, meeting with congressmen and women and senators and, um, you know, advocating for fair pay for music creators. Um, the other side of it, though, is kind of what I was alluding to earlier of, you know, let's make sure that also you're collecting every single penny that you're owed, which is really hard to do because there's so many different income sources now. And most of it's coming in in micro pennies. <laughs> so you have to, you know, you have to collect enough to, um, you know, make a, make a worthwhile check to come in. So, but uh, that's what we're striving to do on both sides of the coin through all of our data work is 
um, making sure we understand where music is getting used and what we should expect and whether or not we're getting that. And if there's like a gap between what we're collecting and what we're seeing um, as like usage data at different places, then yeah, absolutely. We go after it and we try to get it. That's awesome. I mean, I feel like every artist needs that and we don't have time to be chasing all of that down. You've already got the infrastructure set up. So what what is the lag time on the payment? I know I've heard some artists say like it takes them, you know, up to like a year and a half to get their statements from their PROs. Yeah, so it it varies by all PROs. Like every single society is different. But um for the most part in the US, it's about two to three quarters from mm-hmm. when a song is used and when they should get paid. Um, internationally, it's a little bit longer. Some of the international societies only pay out like once or twice a year. Um, so it can be delayed. But, you know, ideally, you're getting it quickly. Typically, also, like the standard expectation is that if money goes uncollected after about three years, then the societies will put that money in black box. And, um, it's, you can't recover it at that point. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is really important to, um, it's really important to get those songs registered and collected on when they're having, you know, a lot of performance because you don't want to lose that revenue. And that's, you know, that's one, like, what's one thing we found that a lot of people love about song trust because, you know, people might have a song that's like gone viral and doing really well. And they are, you know, their career is like taking off and they want to partner with a more traditional publisher and they want to um, find the right fit of somebody who's like, you know, managing their calendar to set up co-writes and do all of this, which is not like services that SongTrust offers. But at SongTrust, we offer a really short term. So we offer a one year term, meaning if you bring a song to us, we'll look after it for a year. And after a year, if you want to take it elsewhere, you can. Um, which is really like a very, very, very short term. And the reason we even have a year is because the societies require it um, because they won't, they're like, well, you can't send songs to us and then tell us two weeks later that it's no longer your song. So what people will do is they'll come to song trust, they'll park a song for a year while they're out there looking for, you know, a more traditional publishing situation and, hopefully if we're doing what we should be doing then downtown music publishing is pitching to be that person Mm -hmm. um and you know we can transfer them over but you know other times people are like i just want to park this for a year see see where my career goes but i don't want to lose that revenue because i haven't given it to a publisher yeah that's a smart thing to do uh you know if you're not sure if you want to go with a, a traditional publisher is at least make sure someone's administering your royalties yep Wow. So um, what is the role of streaming in all of this? I I feel like, you know, you hear how much is being uploaded to streaming services every single day. Has that just made catalogs of music just explode? Yeah. I mean, you know, the more music out there, the better for all of us. (laughs) So, um, but yeah, it's certainly, you know, added and um, added to the, the larger pool and also, forced companies to rethink the way that they're addressing volume. But, you know, there was a there was a huge spike in music creation during the pandemic. And people, um, you know, with accessibility to be able to get music on streaming services, which um, wasn't always the case and allowing songwriters to sign up for publishing administration. um, You know, that was a huge explosion. So it's been really fantastic to see it. But it's it's forced everybody in the music space to rethink how um how you're handling that and you know streaming is such an important part of our revenue like it's it's such a massive percentage of our revenue um that we have to always be rethinking our collection strategy you know checking that data again auditing income sources making sure everything looks great because it's such an important piece yeah and and i know that um in the u.s the MLC was created to distribute some of the money that was awarded from streaming services. If people are with SongTrust, do they also need to sign up for the MLC or do you guys handle that? We handle the MLC. We have a really, really tight relationship with the MLC. That's cool. That's cool because I know that 
a lot of artists have been confused. You know, they've heard about the MLC and they think, you know, they know they need to get in touch with them, but then they're like, but what if I have song trust? So I'm, I'm glad that we covered that because I think some people will have that question. So this is kind of a loaded question, but being that you have so much experience in the industry, like what changes do you think we need to make or need to be made in the industry, you know, to build a more equitable system for everyone? Yeah, that is a very loaded and uh-huh. good question. <laughs> um, you know, I think that, you know, when I think about the music industry, I do think it's made up of a lot of really smart forward thinking people who want to see equity, who want to see inclusion, who are, you know, it's a, it's every single conference I go to, or, um, you know, newsletter I read, it feels like there's a piece in there about that. Um, and it's, it's wildly important. Like we don't want a bunch of music that, um, you know, sounds the same and we want to be able to see, um, you know, songwriters who are just starting out but have written a fantastic song have the same access to success that you know somebody who's been signed to a major label for 10 years has um and you know one thing i i do think is again it's like the mystery of like how do you create a viral moment who really knows yeah. but i'm sure there are there are i'm sure there are very smart people who actually do know um but you know, I think that the rise of social media and things like TikTok and Reels are really creating some space for people who are amazing to have a voice and have a platform that they haven't had before. So, you know, I think it's about always like being able to point back to, um, you know, bringing up new talent and recognizing fantastic talent when you see it, which going back to like having a really diverse group of clients, meaning like, you know, big publishing companies who have 30 writers signed to them to the independent songwriter who's just starting out. Maybe they're like in their college dorm room writing songs. Like when we are able to represent such a wide variety of songwriters, it's a really excellent way for us to make sure that the new fresh songwriters are getting the same level of service as like the professionalized ones. Yeah, I love that you're providing service to everybody at, you know, the different stages of their career. So if people have been listening today and they're like, oh my gosh, you know, I need a publishing administrator, or I just want to know more about uh, song trust, or maybe they are already on song trust and they're like, oh, I didn't know you had downtown publishing. I feel like I'm ready for that. What is the best way for people to get more information and get in touch with you? Yeah. So our, um, admittedly, our downtown website is a work in progress. <laughs> it doesn't have a lot of information there, but, um, our Songtrust off our Songtrust website is really fantastic. There's a, there's a place where you can, um, put in a contact form and hear from somebody, but I would also just like highlight that our social media for song trust, as well as like our education centers on the website are really amazing. And, you know, for us, like there is a sign up fee when you sign up for song trust, we want to make sure that this works for you. And we want to make sure that we're not asking you to pay for something that, um, you know, you, like it's a hundred dollar sign up fee. If you're not going to make a hundred dollars, then let's hold off and figure out what we can do with you to get you to that point. So you're ready for a publishing administrator. So all of that is on the website. Um, and there's so much information there and, uh, you know, we're on TikTok, we're on reels, we're, um, doing all the things <laughs> to make sure people know, um, what to expect from our service. That's awesome. Yeah. I think I follow song trust. I think I've, I think I see some of your, uh, your reels on Instagram. Is it, is it at song trust? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. You guys go follow song trust. They do have some really good content. Um, and song trust website is songtrust.com. That's right. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Emily. This has been really enlightening, especially for those who are still kind of confused about all the terms and, and all that stuff in the publishing world. Um, and then just understanding that there are kind of different levels of support that you can get on the publishing side and, you know, figure out which one is right for you. And you can always you know, move within those. And it's all based upon, you can do it based upon each individual song. Every song has its own life, you know? So I love that Song Trust has that option as well. 
Thank you so much, Emily. This has been really enlightening and um, super helpful to all the artists that are listening. Thanks, Bree. Thanks for listening to The Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.